Hello, everybody. Also, warm welcome from my side to a new uh, edition of Paltech Virtual Talk series. It's great that you all join us to expand your knowledge of powder and book solid, uh, solid technology today. And our general theme is new food. This is a key feature of Powtech, which as a community place to be gathers all experts from a wide range of industry in autumn to exchange ideas on processing technology. So experts from well-known Powtech exhibitors support us today and will show you the latest developments. Um, before I go into the, into the topic, um, I would like to thank to our speakers from Israel, Mr. Dr. Hans Joachim Jacob and Mrs. Dr. Christine uh, Leroux Binder, I hope I pronounced it right, <laughs> from NEET, uh, without whom this would not be possible. And now I hand over to Dr. Hans Joachim Jacob from Israel and his talk about processing of protein and the production of new food products. So enjoy the talk. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the, um, yeah, uh, for the invitation for this talk. This is always uh, very good. And um, my topic today, this is um, a topic, a very important topic in new food uh, production. I know we have many, many topics. We have uh, new sweeteners, new modified starches, new thickeners, gelling, and we have new emulsifiers or fat substitutes, a lot of interesting things. But by far the most interesting is really um, the handling of protein, the dispersion of protein. And um, we find proteins in all new food, or in, in, I think in almost all new food products, and when you uh, look at this uh, slide here, then you can see a couple of examples. Of course, here on this um, picture, you can see many, many, uh, let's say milk substitutes, non-dairy plant-based milk substitutes. And, and we have not only these products, of course, this is the biggest field, but we have also uh, products which are based on non dairy uh, ingredients. And uh, this way we can make desserts, ice creams, we can make spreads, custards, yeah, cheese analogs is a, is a yeah, hot topic. Yeah, and also um, yeah, spray dried non-dairy uh, milk products. And of course, one big field is also cultured meat, meat alternatives, sausages. Of course, you will hear uh, a little bit later today in another uh, talk, you will hear a lot about um, these processes. Mr. Jacob, we yeah. can see your presentation. So maybe you there went something wrong. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one moment. <laughs> uh, then I check once more. I share the screen screen number one do you see it now that looks good thank it you looks good. <laughs> but you see already milk products you see all the other products a little bit an example in the middle and you see though know, these 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 burgers what we are doing is or what we are with our process, what we are responsible uh, for, this is a little bit so this this juicy uh, behavior of the cultured meat of these meat alternatives. So, uh, and for that reason, we are using specific um, yeah thickeners, but also proteins. Yeah, protein is is a is a very interesting uh, field. What are uh, or where are the proteins coming from? Of course, the most interesting sources in the near future will be oat, soy, and rice because I guess they are, uh, let's say, we have from these materials, we have, um, let's say, the biggest volumes of um, yeah, proteins. Fava, this is, sometimes it's called the new soy, <laughs> yeah? And um, atsuki, atsuki bean, these are called superfood, yeah? Uh, these are the, uh, one, one of these uh, red beans here on my uh, slide. And, uh, they have a very high protein, they have a very high vitam vitamin content, they are healthy, they are healing, they are uh, working against some uh, versions of cancer and reduce cholesterol. So you see, this is um, um, really uh, interesting um, material. And um, yeah, then we have 
uh, chickpeas, lentils, peas, with, which are inexpensive uh, alternatives. Peas and beans have 20% uh, protein. This is more than, for example, oat has, and then many, many, many others. So these are all plant-based products. My personal thinking is, my personal thinking is that in future, we will have much more proteins from fermentation processes. And uh, these fermentation is based on bacteria, is based on yeast, and such fermentation processes are probably made in systems like that, what you see here. This system is, uh, you know, uh, the, the interesting uh, thing of um, this um, fermentation is that you can use biomass. Yeah? You do not need fresh food. You can use even waste from food production. You can use stems. You can use leaves or not usable parts of the fruits yeah, or plants. And they have, at the end, they have a high protein content, 50% and more. Yeah? And they have no flavor. They have no taste. They contain all essential amino acids. They contain vitamin B12. I think for that reason, um, fermented proteins will be, in my eyes, will be very important in the future. And of course, um, especially precision, precision fermentation. This system, what you see here, can be used for precision fermentation. Here on the left side, there is the addition of the uh, active ingredients. They are pre-mixed under closed conditions. They are added safe conditions. And then here we have uh, the nutrition bros, and we um, yeah, control all the um, conditions to produce specific flavors or to produce programmed or with programmed bacteria, pro programmed yeast, we are making completely new food products. So this is that what we expect, what I expect in the future. At the end, we get the protein typically as a powder. Here you have two examples on the left side. This is called a whole grain oat milk powder. On the right side, this is an, um, yeah, it's a pea uh, floor. And um, we have to disperse, we have to wet them into typically into water, into a water base, sometimes also in a mix. Powders are coming in total different flow behaviors. Both pictures here, left and right side, both are oat powders, oat floor, but you see the difference. Left side, this is that what we expect as oat. On the right side, we see how much compacted these materials are, and these are only uh, two examples. When we disperse proteins in water-based products, we have four different problems to solve. They tend to foam. They need high shear to develop in the liquid, but they are destroyed under shear. So this is, uh, so that means we need to find the optimum compromise, uh, the optimum way not to destroy it, but to shear it completely, to disperse it correctly. They tend to stick, for example, with the wall of the tank, with everything, and they form agglomerates. These four problems must be solved. You can see here on this slide uh, what could happen when you use the wrong method and the wrong equipment. On the left side, the tank is full of foam. In the middle, it looks quite okay, but uh, it has a, a, a light uh, yellow shine and it has uh, foam on the top. And on the right side, we see a nice yellow color and we see no foam on top. The difference here in the process of that, the difference is only the way how to handle it the tools, what you are using, and the way in what moment and under what shear you are dispersing these products. So you can avoid the foam issue. The second issue is the issue with the shear sensitivity. Proteins have a complicated structure. They have a quaternary structure, which you see here at the, uh, at the lower picture, a tertiary structure, a secondary and the primary structure. So the primary structure, this is so to say the molecule structure of the, um, of the amino acids, how they are collected, connected to each other, sorry. And then in the second part, they are folded or they are twisted to helices. 
Yeah. So, and then they are forming uh, further structures. Typically, when we want to produce, for example, a curd, when we want to produce a spread, a dessert, then we even don't want to touch the quaternary structure. We must keep the quaternary structure alive. If we want to make a spray dried baby food, for example, yeah, then we have to destroy the quaternary and the tertiary structure completely, but not chemically, not with enzymes, not with acids, no, just with high shear. And this is possible. For that reason, we have the possibility to, to play with rotation speeds, with distances between uh, in, in, in rotor stator gaps, between rotors and stators. So in this way, we can control exactly that you get exactly what you need for your, you know, let's say, um, um, beverage, for your dessert, or for your, for your meat um, uh, product, your meat alternative. So the next problem, what I mentioned, was the co adhesiveness or the adhesiveness of the of the proteins on the left side this is a picture of gluten gluten is wheat protein and wheat protein is famous for his cohesivity yeah it is sticking in each other it is not sticking to the wall of the tank but when you stop mixing then it flocculates together and we need a special mixer. And this mixer is a mixer and disperser, a combination of mixing and dispersing. And with this, you can cover this problem. On the right side, you see a much worse problem. This is the adhesiveness. When a material sticks inside a rotor stator system or in a pump or somewhere in, a, in, a, in another device, and it stands still while the other side is rotating, then you have the situation that this material may uh, even burn, yeah? may uh, change the color. So for all these things, we have developed a system which solves these uh, issues completely. And this system is a combination, is a combination of a specific mixer inside the tank and a powder inducting and dispersing machine. The specific mixer inside the tank, this is, for example, important when we have re-agglomerating materials. And then we need not only a jet stream mixer like this here, you can see my, my mouse moving, yeah? Not uh, only a jet stream mixer, which, which mixes vertically, no. We need additionally a slight shearing effect, which avoids the re-agglomeration. -agglom um, and this is that what solves the issue of the uh, cohesiveness. So the rest is done with the machine here at the right side. This is a machine which inducts powder with vacuum and disperses it into liquid. It has, it has three uh, connections, liquid inlet, powder inlet, product outlet. The powder is here, this is our protein, and the powder is then inducted through this, um, now let's say through this way into the machine. You see already from this picture, powder side here on the right side, liquid side on the left side, powder and liquid are separated from each other. And even inside the machine, they are separated from each other. Yeah? Inside there is a disc, a rotating disc, and this rotating disc separates powder from liquid until they get into this stator. The blue one is the stator. And the stator has a fishbone shape. And in this stator, we are dispersing the, powder into the liquid. This is how the system rotates. And while it rotates, of course, with much, much higher speed, the powder and the liquid are dispersed with each other. And the point is every single particle, every single particle of the protein must be vetted separately. Only this way, we can avoid that we overshear the product and that we reach the maximum out of this protein material. How do we do that? Then powder is coming under atmospheric conditions, then the particles are touching each other. Our system inducts with a strong vacuum, and this vacuum has a very interesting effect. As long as powder is flying, as long as powder is moving, and the vacuum is higher and higher and higher, the wider are the gaps between the particles. And this is that what helps us. We are getting distances between the particles. And when both material, powder and liquid, are getting through the rotor stator zone, 
then they are mixed in the liquid, they are completely surrounded by the liquid and completely vetted and dispersed. In original, it looks like this here. That means you can see here, this is the dense powder stream. The powder particles are getting looser and looser from each other, and then they are really, really separate, and we are mixing single particles in. That is, this is the trick. Yeah? This is how we are dispersing proteins into liquids and avoiding all these uh, issues. How could such a package uh, look like? You can see here such a powder induction dispersing machine, which can induct from a powder hopper, manual edition, yeah, so back tip station, and from an automatic uh, system. Yeah, and these automatic systems, they can be, yeah, let's say, so you can you can provide the different materials. Typically, you have not only one; you have a, a number of uh, materials. These systems are also created so that you can work with allergen and non-allergen products, so that you can clean them completely, or that at least that you can also uh, have uh, separate lines for allergen uh, proteins and non-allergen proteins or powders in general. Yeah. A very typical installation is like you have seen this in my previous picture that such a machine here is installed in recirculation with the tank. I want to show you some other examples. Another example is that we make a concentrate. The background is, especially when we make um, milk alternatives, then we have big, big volumes. And is it possible, it's definitely possible, to produce such a milk alternative, alternative um, from, from, from oat or from, from soy or from whatever, um, in, in 50,000 liter tanks. But uh, it is more effective when we make them in a small concentrated uh, version. This way, while the big tank is filled with water and with other liquid ingredients, um, we do at the same time the whole process with all the powders. We are adding all the powders. We are at dispersing all the powders here in, in this loop. And we are adding then the concentrate together with the rest of the liquid in the big process tank. The interesting thing is such a batch has no batch time. Such a batch is ready when the tank is filled. When the tank is filled, you have all ingredients in. They are all mixed homogeneously. You have a jet stream mixer, which makes permanently mixing. Originally, it looks a little bit different. In, uh, originally, it looks approximately like this. So you have different powder handling possibilities, back tip station, big back handling station, uh, sometimes also yeah, systems which are working from silo. So this is a, a concentrate. This is a, a, a yeah, let's say process with the concentrate. Another interesting possibility is inline production. We induct all the ingredients, all the powder ingredients in a controlled way while we are filling the process tank. And this way, it's also so when the filling is finished, then the whole process is finished. So two examples on the left side, this is a system for the dispersion of amino acids. In this case, we are dispersing lysine. Lysine is uh, used, of course, uh, when, you, when you want to build up muscles, but it is also used in uh, production of um, medicine and also in production of food uh, for animals. Yeah? And on the right side is a hydrolyzation plant. And this hydrolyzation plant is used for protein hydrolyzation. So hydrolyzation means you are, so to say, reducing the proteins down to single amino acids or to very short uh, chains. We can disperse, of course, uh, protein powders, protein concentrates, protein isolates. All these are looking like floor here on, on, the, on the left uh, picture, but it is also possible and it's very interesting. We can, with the same machine, we can disperse also grain. Yeah, this is oat grain here at the right side. And the interesting thing is um, you are interested or most of you might be interested in uh, separation and extraction of the, um, of the protein out of this material. And this is possible directly from grains. We can disperse the grain and um, yeah, you don't need to use, um, let's say, pre-ground uh, floor. And interesting was also, we got more protein out of this process because the filtering, the separation afterwards was easier. All, for all the systems, we have small system trial um, systems, 
uh, scale up um, is possible from small batch to large batch as well for the inline machines and also for the um, you know, batch dispersers. I think this was um, a short um, introduction and um, yeah, probably if you are interested, um, yeah, might be uh, you have also some questions. <laughs> So now I come back again. <laughs> so yes, there are two questions here. And the first yeah. question is, what is the typical RPM? Um, typical RPM, um, and, you know, we are variable. Typical or standard RPM is 3000 RPM, 3000. But um, for the mixers, 1500. But we are adjusting to your requirements. Yeah. Um, when you want to reduce the um, uh, quaternary structure, then we go to higher speeds, 3,600 RPM or more. When you want to be very, very careful, you, want, you don't want to touch the material or you have other ingredients in your pro product which are shear sensitive, of course, we can also go down. Powder induction starts approximately at 1,800 with the powder inducting machine. Okay, so I hope the question is answered. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> so uh, first of all, um, special thanks to the presentation. And um, he wrote, you showed an interesting machine and process, but also complex mechanism inside the machine. How is your workflow to find the perfect machine parameters for these different kinds of material? Yeah, um, today our topic is proteins. Um, we have three basic versions of protein dispersing machines. I have shown only one today. So, and these three versions are because we have these different, especially these uh, uh, different uh, sticking behaviors. So we have different version. If you, for example, if you are using a pure protein or if you have only a protein concentrate. And, and so we, we, we have variations. If you are interested or if you have a specific one, a specific powder, I think then we can answer exactly what is the right version. And this is also related to the induction speed. We do not want to over concentrate your product. We always control the induction speed and this can be done according to the current uh, concentration in the batch, or we can just, if it is a simple process, we can just adjust it according to recipe, and then we induct with a controlled induction speed um, so that we do not over-concentrate your product. Okay, so maybe then there's an additional question uh, from the first um, one for sure. How do you cover corrosion effects by amino acid? Yeah, um, uh, um, actually machine is completely stainless steel. So that means uh, in respect of uh, anti-corrosion, we are able to work with normal stainless steel if we have, because of the process, if we have some acids and we need higher qualities, then it is possible to use, for example, higher acid resistant materials like 140, um, 145, 39, for example, or we can also use Hustelloy. So that means nickel um, uh, alloys. So we, we, we um, have to know exactly what uh, resistance we need and then we can follow that. Yeah. Okay, then uh, we've got, one last question. <laughs> um, it's how do you control the feed of product into the liquid to get a certain concentration? Yeah, a uh, simple version is with the opening of the powder inlet. You know, we are working with vacuum and the vacuum creates an, so to say a pressure difference and you can control the induction rate with the orifice, with the opening. So um, if we have a simple process and we have not too much var varieties. Our um, preferred version is with a nozzle with a specific diameter. If we have various uh, um, recipes, then we are using uh, operated valves. That means we, we operate a valve, we open this in controlled angle, and we are measuring the uh, induction speed 
yeah, how much loss in weight we have, and we can control exactly what the induction rate is. This is something what we do in trials at first. We have a test center, and in this test center, typically with the customer, we make a couple of uh, trials. And in these trials, of course, I prefer that we also do a trial which fails. I want to see what is, uh, so to say, too fast, <laughs> so that we know exactly what are the limits. What should we do? Should we not never touch? Yeah. So, and then we know exactly in what range we can, in what window we can induct. Okay, so we reached one last question <laughs> because time is running. Um, the last one, how do you deal with abrasive materials? Assume grains are very abrasive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have harder stainless steel materials. This is not normal stainless steel material. You know, when you have, uh, for example, knives uh, or scalpels, uh, they are using stainless steel, but this is uh, hardened stainless steel. So, and we also use these um, materials and they have an eight time longer lifetime than normal stainless steel. Um, we don't use ceramics. We have tested ceramics. Our problem with ceramics is that sometimes in these materials, even in powders as in grains, there could be foreign pieces and a ceramic um, uh, rotor stator system is very brittle, so it could break. So we have coatings, but coatings is not that what you want because these coatings get lost. So the best is for your application is that you have um, complete solid material and that is, um, more, yeah, let's say modified in hardness, yeah. Good. So thank you very much, Dr. Jacob, for your interesting uh, talk here <laughs> yep. and for answering all the questions. So uh, dear participants, if you have any further questions uh, to Dr. Jacob, please uh, write us an email to powtech at nuremberg.messe.de and um, yes, we will forward your questions then. <laughs> so yeah. um, in this- Or you come to the Powtech in, in September. This is my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <Also possible. laughs> yes. So. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you. Good. Now, um, it's all about new protein sources. It's about insect processing. Uh, look forward to Dr. Christine Le Rubinder and uh, Michael Kraus from Netsch Grinding and Dispersing. So, Mr. Kraus, the stage is yours. <laughs> so, hello. Welcome also from, from my side. And thanks, of course, for, for attending today the, the virtual talks from, from Powtech. Um, still need to share my screen. Okay. So I hope you can you can see the screen now. So what what I want to talk about today is the topic uh, new protein sources with a with a focus on <coughs> insect processing and how we handle this from, from Netsch side and from our, from our business field, um, food and, and pharma. Um, I'm, I'm not alone today. Uh, I'm not the only speaker from, from Netsch today. So Christine Leroux Binder um, is in the loop as well. So she's also working for in technical sales for business field, food and pharma, but more on the, on the dry grinding side. And, and myself also working for technical sales, food and pharma uh, at Netsch Fine Malt Technic, uh, which is the, the wet processing site uh, for the wet grinding applications. Um, just, a, just a quick comment from, from my side at this stage, because we only have the 20 minutes. And uh, of course, we will have time for, for uh, questions after the presentation, but just in case, 
um, any question can not be answered or if you have any specific request, um, you will also find our contact details from, from Christine and myself after the presentation on the last slide. And you can just get in, in contact also with me um, directly and we can speak about this uh, topics separately. Um, so to, to start, uh, not to start with a, with a main topic of insect processing uh, today, I just want to also give you a short overview uh, where Netch comes from, uh, what the what the business units are. And this will just give you here a, a short overview. So the Netch group is split into three business units, which is on the one side analyzing and testing uh, for, for the characterization of uh, uh, material properties. And we have pumps and systems on the other side for various applications where Netch is very well known for. And again, what we are focusing on today is uh, from grinding and dispersing. Uh, as I already introduced, we want to focus on uh, wet and dry grinding applications and especially what possibilities we have for wet and dry grinding for insects as new food today. Um, Netch, for those who don't know, Netch, the grinding and dispersing uh, business unit is operating worldwide. We have our headquarter, also where I'm located in, in Selp, in Bavaria, northern part of Bavaria. But apart from that, uh, Netch is operating worldwide, globally in, in Europe and also outside of Europe with different uh, sales and production facilities. Two start with the main topic of of today and i just want to start with some uh, basic information uh, about insects as new protein source and i think uh, this is also the reason why why we are uh, why we're having this virtual talk and why you're participating in the virtual talk today because we strongly believe that uh, the insect is a future resource for alternative proteins and a, a nutritional uh, resource for the future. So uh, what can what are the insects used for the, the products what you get out from the insects to to summarize this quickly according to let's say the standards or the processes uh, how they're set up on industrial scale uh, today is basically you get an insect flower insect meal with a very high protein content above uh, 50% from it. You get an insect oil, or you can just work with a with whole insect when you wanna keep the uh, processes quite slim and uh, lower the, the costs. And then we have the, the processing on the other side. And when I speak about the, the processing, um, I mean, the technical processing, especially the uh, grinding from, from our side. And the processing for us starts where the rearing ends. So uh, it's, it's clear that today there are uh, uh, specialized insect farms. But after the, after the insects, after the rearing process, after the harvesting, there comes the, the technical uh, processing and the, the application in as animal feed and human food or for human consumption as well. And there was also um, a lot of progress also this year, more positive progress. And yeah, in, in general, of course, the, the insects need to be need, need to be killed. And then if you when you look at the, the following processes, you also need to consider um, of course, how you how you package the, the insects or the, the larvae or the product in general, if you need to uh, deliver it uh, freeze dried or in what format you will um, transport the product, the pulverized or the, the insect powder after the uh, dry grinding application. I have um, outlined this um, in, the, in these different uh, process steps. Um, and also to highlight, of course, with this slide, where Netch is focusing on. 
So a niche is mainly focusing here at the at the end when we speak about the the processing or our definition of the processing. And niche is mainly focusing on the wet grinding application and the dry grinding application. But as you can see, and I just wanted to outline this in uh, in bullet points, there's much more to consider when uh, speaking about insect processing, especially when you when you start with a with a byproduct handling, the breeding and the rearing process, and then just the, the processing starts. So Netch is focusing on uh, the wet grinding and the dry grinding, and this is what I would like to uh, introduce to you today. Um, what we are working on, because I think the topic is is new to to all of us, uh, but there were some some developments, especially over the last two years, also from from Netch side, and today we are covering different processes on the on the wet grinding side, on the wet wet processing side, and on the dry processing side, as well. What Christine will explain in a minute. So we have the the wet grinding part at the beginning, which is for us a kind of uh, pre-grinding step. After we can transfer the product, so after we have the uh, the larvae paste or we get the larvae paste um, out from the first pre-grinding step, we can pump this to a, to a process tank. And then if there is the requirement uh, from, from the customer, from manufacturer side, uh, we can even uh, process it through our horizontal bead mill uh, to achieve an even finer product on the wet grinding side. And we have similar equipment to reach at the end different finenesses of insect flour also on the dry grinding side. To continue with the wet processing. So what I just explained uh, is how the, the process looks like. So we have the, the pre-grinding first, what we call wet grinding, to make from, uh, from whole insect, uh, to grind the whole insects, um, to get an, an insect paste or a larvae paste out from it, which can be processed or recirculated, depends on different goals, which need to come from the from manufacturer side, of course and to achieve the right fineness. Maybe we are already achieved the right fineness uh, from the, from the pre-grinding step, or we can go through the fine grinding as well. And this is how it looks like if you, if you put it down in a, in a picture. So you would basically start from whole insect, which are, uh, which are killed in, in this case, which were boiled. And then you put it through the pre-grinding you can set different parameters to, to achieve different finenesses of the larvae paste. And then you become, uh, you can decrease the fineness more and more and do the fine grinding to get an even more liquid uh, larvae paste out from it. So what are, the, what are the applications today? What are our applications today or our experience? What we uh, could find out during several trials um, over the over the last two years. So on the on the wet processing side, we have mainly two applications. It is actually as simple as that. So we have uh, grinding the grinding of the frass. So there's also uh, uh, I've also for for those who are not familiar with frass, um, I've also included a short description here on the uh, bottom left side. Um, of the of the slide, um, the frass is basically you can also call it as a rest product from the from the rearing process or the byproduct handling in general, which is due to the grinding step can then be used as fertilizer for farming, um, or of course also as part of uh, animal feed or as substrate and use it. Um, again, during the insect rearing process, uh, of course, for a certain percentage. And on the other side, uh, what I already explained on the previous slide is the grinding of the of raw larvae or uh, cooked boiled larvae, um, where you get a larvae paste out from it, which is then used 
mainly um, for the applications um, of animal feed or the human food application. So what is also important or for us good to know also when you have specific requests, if we maybe speak about uh, doing trials, and this is just what, what we learn from it. Um, when we speak about wet or also the dry processing, it is very important for us to also know about the, the fat or the moisture content, especially when we speak about the composition of raw larvae and the frost. So we can not only uh, not always be sure what the fat and the moisture content is, and for us, uh, we all we need to find out uh, during the trials how the the product is actually behaving, and what um, what the right machinery or also if the wet process is applicable uh, is applicable for it, or the dry processing, and uh, sometimes also the manufacturers or the producers uh, are not sure because it always depends also on the on the time for the for the rearing when you harvest the larvae, which size it has, or what substrate was used uh, during the rearing process. And also important is how we can influence. So because we found out during trials that you also get a lot of oxidation um, after the, after the pre-grinding. So we need to influence the shelf life. And what is very important, and the manufacturers also need to take care of it, or at least consider it, um, what, how does the, the complete process looks like? So also the following process after the grinding, you have any transport involved, or you have a just-in-time production um, where, you, where you straight go into a drying or sterilization process after our uh, grinding step. And for uh, future considerations and future developments, um, for sure, also what we don't know today, there will be, but there will be different standards for processing insects. Um, and there will be a different, uh, for sure, in animal feed or the human food application, what we will uh, very likely see in near future. Then this is how it looks like uh, practically. So when we, uh, just one example, when we received the, the raw larvae, in this case was uh, processing of mealworms, um, we, we chose to, to do the dosing through a vibrating sieve. Then we dosed uh, through gravity into our, our master cream, what you also see in a minute. Uh, which what we use as a pre-grinding tool to get a larvae paste. So it, this is, as you can see on the picture, is really in a in a liquid form. Um, the goal in this case was to reach a fineness below one millimeter or 1,000 microns, and then we can also do a precise um, analysis about the particle size distribution um, and let's say, according to the parameters or according to the ma machine, what we are choosing, we can then try to achieve the different requirements from the, from the customers to, to reach different finances. So to summarize this again, and to summarize the equipment also what we are using uh, for the wet processing is basically in the pre-grinding step, we would use a master cream inline or can be used as an inline version or can be dosed through gravity to bring the, the larvae to a size below one millimeter. Then you could uh, include a, a process tank or do a recirculation through the process tank back into the, into the master cream. Uh, so the, the process can always be individually be set up. And after um, our core technology of a horizontal bead mill would also achieve even uh, an even finer product. But from, from our experience, um, I think the requests were what are currently coming in is mainly to achieve a target fineness around one millimeter or just to be 100% uh, below one millimeter.
Okay, that's it from my side. Now I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, yeah. Mrs. Okay. Binder. I try to see. <sighs> okay. Uh, it's right now for you. Can you see? Yeah, my presentation. Michael. Ja, wir sind aber den Präsentationsmodus. Ja. Yeah. Okay, I don't understand. Sorry, I must look again. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Before it's no work, problem. now it don't work. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and now, that was the same. Okay, I look again. Perhaps this. You told me. If yes. You, that was right, yeah? Yes. Okay. That, that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, no, it's my, okay. Now I uh, won't make a presentation about uh, uh, the different uh, process we can use in dry grinding for the insect powder. Uh, we propose uh, our uh, experience is that uh, first uh, we can use an impact mill. Conducts. It's a mechanical process. Uh, we have uh, the machine, and with this machine, we can use uh, different uh, tools, for example, a blast footer or wing beater. And these two uh, tools can we use with, in combination with a screen, and we can uh, with these tools and uh, to play with the speed of the of the rotor. And the size of the screen uh, achieve different uh, quality and fineness. We have also another uh, tools is open disk, and uh, with these tools we can play with the speed of this rotor. And uh, with uh, this machine we can achieve uh, grinding uh, from uh, 100 to 300 micron at 90 percent. We have another machine we can propose also for uh, insect powder is a classifier mill. It's also an impact mill. Uh, in this machine, we have a grinding disc and we have a classifier. Uh, the product will be fit in the uh, grinding chamber and will be grinding with this uh, uh, grinding disc. And we have an aspiration and uh, the product go out through the classifier, if enough fines. If not, it stay in the grinding uh, chamber and we can play to achieve uh, the desired uh, fineness with the speed of the grinding disc and the speed of the classifier. As with, uh, and with this machine, we can have a fineness uh, between 30 to 100 micro, uh, micron, uh, 90%. It's a short presentation of the machine we can use uh, at this time for uh, insect uh, powder. Um, we have some experience and we have um, with uh, some customer make some uh, uh, trials. And I show you some experience and trials we have uh, uh, make made with a customer. For example, we have we use a mealworm roasted or mealworm uh, extruded. Uh, significant, this is uh, this uh, worm are with fat, uh, content of fat. Uh, it's, uh, this, um, it's always a problem with dry grinding if a product is with, uh, with high fat content. Uh, we have made a, a test with uh, our lab uh, test machine with this uh, impact mill and uh, with uh, tools with a pin disc. And um, for this case, sorry, for this case, because uh, considering the fat content uh, and to have the possibility to, to, to achieve a grinding with this, uh, with this product, uh, the customer was interested to make a mix with 80% of wet flour 
and 20% uh, of mealworm roasted or extruded. And uh, we have uh, it's, it's, its work, and uh, we have uh, make a grinding, and we have achieved 99% uh, under 500 micro. So you can see uh, at, at the end of, of the, the grinding uh, process what we can achieve for powder. Uh, we have other uh, customers, they have uh, other. Uh, Product with insect, insect. It was a uh, insect powder, powder, and um, in this case, this this powder has uh, no fat or very low fat, and uh, for dry grinding is easier. Yeah, uh, and uh, with this, uh, it was uh, two different product. It was what put one product with uh, little pellets, and another product it was a, a coarser powder. And we, again, we have used uh, our lab, uh, laboratory machine, uh, Contuc 60, and in this case with blast photo and use as a screen. And uh, the customer, uh, the target was not very fine. It was, uh, and we have achieved 99% under 1,100 micro. Another example uh, we have uh, uh, tested is, uh, with a bigger machine because uh, um, first we make uh, feasibility with a little machine, the Conduct 60, but the next step is to see uh, how we can, um, so the quantity we can produce with the machine because uh, to, uh, for, for the factory and uh, a customer say, okay, I want uh, uh, 300, 500 kilo per hour or more. And uh, after the feasibility, we look with a, a test with a bigger machine uh, uh, to to make a later uh, possibility to scale up, yeah. And in this case, we have used also the the impact machine, yeah. In this case, I, uh, I'm sorry, it's a mistake. It's a it's a Condux 150. It's a bigger machine, and is in this uh, case we have uh, as two uh, wing beater and with a screen. And uh, we have achieved uh, in this case the customer want to. Uh, uh, finest uh, product, 99% under 300 micro, it will be possible. And uh, with this machine, we have achieved uh, 300, 400 kilo per hour. Uh, it's not a very big, ma big machine. Uh, and um, to know for dry grinding, uh, difference with wet grinding, uh, you must always uh, take care of uh, explosions uh, protection. And we have solution also for this case. And for example, this uh, compact system is a complete 10 bar pressure resistant. Um, to know, uh, we have a test center um, because this, yeah, before we, we can uh, propose an installation for the customer, we must make tests uh, to see uh, first the feasibility and uh, to make a scale up, uh, to know what the size of the machine uh, we can propose. Uh, we have a test center for the dry grinding. It's a uh, food lab is um, in, uh, uh, in South from Frankfurt in Hanau. In this test center, uh, we have different machine we can uh, make test. Uh, for a uh, uh, wet grinding, for my colleague, uh, Michael Cross, uh, is, uh, we have also the white lab, and this is in the uh, facility in Germany, also in Zelb. This is a uh, south uh, ost from uh, Germany. And uh, for a uh, dispersing uh, system, we have also a um, pharma lab, and this is in uh, north from uh, Germany. Uh, for the white lab, um, we have a uh, possibility to make trials with different machine. For example, the Master Refiner 6 or Master Refiner 30. We have the Lab Mill PE5 or Master Cream 10. And uh, for this test, we have a laboratory where we can make a different uh, analysis. Uh, for example, with the laser system, Malva or Rheometer or the moisture content or the ultrasonic homogenizer, 
or we have a sieving system. Um, in food lab, uh, for dry grinding, we have also a different machine, different size. Uh, as I explained, it's a Condux 150. We have also the Condux 60. And if, if we want to be sure, if, for example, the customer say, ah, I need uh, one ton per hour, uh, and it's better to, to make uh, this test of a bigger machine for the scale up. And in this, uh, we, can use, uh, we can use different machine in our installation to make uh, the test. We have also a labor machine, for example, in this case, uh, show is a, a conjet 10, what I not uh, presented uh, today, but uh, for example, we have a customer for insect is interested, interested to, um, also we have make test with this for insect powder uh, to achieve a very fine, uh, fine product. And uh, it's possible in our, a test center in Germany to achieve uh, this uh, test. Um, I think um, I, it was a very short presentation, but I want to, to, to show you what is possible, what is our experience in this uh, insect world. And uh, as my uh, colleague uh, explained, uh, if you have some question, you can uh, directly uh, uh, contact us if you uh, need it. We are there for you. Yeah. Many thanks. Thank you very much <laughs> for your <laughs> talks. <laughs> um, as I can see in our F and A, um, we have a question. I think it's for Michael. So maybe he can come back perfect so um i think you can see also the question in in the f and a button what is the typical practical size distribution psd intake uh, finished product um so i can answer that for the mm -hmm. for the wet grinding side but i think there's a comment uh, that it's meant for the for the dry grinding application actually but yeah. in in any case anyways answered it uh, so uh, in from the most tries what we we did several trials over the over the last uh, two years and the the main requirement what what we got from the from our clients was to reach an target fineness for wet or dry grinding application uh, to reach 100 percent below one millimeter and this was also what we achieved of course also what uh, what Mrs. Binder um, now now explained is when we, for example, uh, grind the the insect flour or insect powder um, at the at the very end of the process using a conchet mill, for example, we can also reach an even finer product. So we can also go into the direction of of hundred microns. Uh, so at the ninety value of uh, of hundred microns or anything in, in between. And as uh, Mrs. Binder explained, we need to find this out during, during the trials. Uh, we need to see what the, what the requirements are from, from our clients. Um, we need to see what the, what the fat and moisture content is to define the right process, find the right machine, and then we can uh, make the right choice and also make a precise scale up at the end. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, and then there is another question. What is the capa capacity of the machines or the equipment for the wet and the dry process? Um, so the capacity, as I think I explained it, and but I'm happy to say this again, um, <laughs> is always, always depends a bit on the, on the, again, on the fat and the moisture content. And we, first of all, uh, depending on the on the fat content, we decide is it is it more applicable uh, for the for the wet side or for the for the dry grinding side. And but so to to give a rough understanding for our uh, from for the wet grinding side, from our uh, experience uh, from the trials with the with the pre grinding machine, 
with a master cream, we achieved a throughput of up to seven to eight tons per hour. And and this and for the for the dry grinding side, what I can say for the for the insect powder, um, we can depending of course on the size, but we have the equipment also to achieve a throughput of up to two tons per hour for the insect powder. Yeah, also it's depending of the the the. Uh, the finest, but we can, uh, on depending of the machine, but we can also more to turn, so we can also four, four, five tons. But yeah, it's depending of the products, depending of the the fineness, fineness, yeah, for dry grinding. Yeah. So, so this is also why we mentioned the the test center, what we mm -hmm. can offer, what we what we do for for basically all all our applications um, at Netch. So this is also why we why we have to why we have to set up, why we want to invite the the clients. And when we know the, the right fat content, we can choose the right machine. And also, um, so we also not always need to do big trials of mm -hmm. 100 mm -hmm. or 200 kilos. Mm -hmm. um, so also customers are always welcome to do, let's say we can also do a feasibility test for the beginning to see the, the behavior, to, uh, to, get a, to get a feeling, to get a first impression, to get a first uh, product sample, and then to go further in the process and yeah, scale up from there. Okay, so uh, time is running. It's um, <laughs> <Thank you laughs> quite fast right now. So thank you very much, both of you, uh, for thank this you. interesting talk. Thank um, you. Thank and you. here as well, if you have any questions uh, to the two speakers, just contact us uh, at powtech at nurnbergmesser.de and we will connect you then. So in this, Thank you very much, <laughs> Michael okay. and Thank you. Christine. Thank you. Good. Last but not least, <laughs> I will hand over to Dr. Patrick Wittek from Coperion and his talk on extrusion technology for the production of plant-based meat substitutes. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm just... Can you see the presentation? Yes, looks very good. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Also, thank you very much for the opportunity to present us here at this virtual talk. Um, my name is Patrick Wittek. I'm a process engineer at Coperion. I'm in the food extrusion group. We are all together five process engineers um, working on all topics regarding food extrusion. So starting from, of course, these plant-based meat substitutes to all other imaginable um, applications of our students. And today I'm here to talk about a bit more about um, the production of those plant-based meat substitutes. Um, with that, I want, of course, also to shortly introduce our company and also show what can we do with our technology with our machines um, to help you get to the product you want to achieve and um, give a, a short overview of, of the entire topic. Um, so first of all, um, we as Coperion are working on many different fields in, in the food um, in the food topic. What I already mentioned, we have um, technology in the extrusion field. So we have one of the first or we have the first twin screw extruder introduced by Werner and Fleiderer and have been technology leaders ever since. Um, we also offer pneumatic conveying, so a material handling for getting the material into the extruder. And um, there we have over six, 70 years um, experience um, all over the world. And we offer feeding solutions, so volumetric and gravimetric feeders, um, also to get the material into the extruder um, with our own state-of-the-art weighting technology. And we also ha um, have rotary and diverter walls um, to get hygienic design into those food processing and material handling steps. We are present all over the world. So our headquarters is in Stuttgart, where we also have our test lab and our um, production and manufacturing. I will go more to, into detail later. And But we are also represented um, with some companies and sites and representatives all over the world, as you can see here on this world map. So wherever you are, you can contact um, one of our representatives. Um, and now let's get into 
into the topic. So the topic of texturized proteins or meat analogs or meat substitutes. Um, in general, there are two different meat substitutes that can be deferred or two main products on the market. First of all, there's these high moisture meat analogs or abbreviated HMMA. So that's a, a vet product as you can see on those pictures on the left side. So these only have to be marinated and are directly ready for consumption. And you have those texturized vegetable proteins or abbreviated TVP, and which is a dry product that has to be um, rehydrated before consumption. Both of them are produced to mimic the structure of real meat and find many different applications. Um, I go to, into detail shortly here. Um, so what is the difference here between HMA and TVP? Um, for HMA, in the process you add, in the extrusion process, you add water between 50 and 70%, while for the TVP you'll add less, much less water. So between 10 and 30%, everything depending on the raw material, depending on which material um, you want to process and which product structure and texture you want to achieve. And from this, uh, properties of the materials, there are also the storage conditions um, defined. Because HMA is a wet product, you have to chill it or freeze it after the production. Um, and for the TVP, it is dried after the production, so you can just um, store it, you have a long shelf life, and um, it's a bulk product. In general, the HMA has dense layered fibers, and the TVP has more of an expanded fiber structure, sometimes a bit spongy. Um, depending on, on, on the product. And the HMA find applications in ready-to-eat dishes, for example, you have probably seen them already as like chicken chunks, which can be added to salad or to any like Thai, Thai dishes or what, whatever you can think of. And TVP um, is soaked in water prior to use and is then re, uh, remodeled in, for example, burgers or for minced meat or for example, for sausages. Um, so that's just like, you can see it more like an intermediate product here. Um, so to go into more detail with both products, um, go here to the HMA product, what happens in the process? So in the process, you have a protein powder premix. So this can be from different sources. This can be soy protein, pea protein, sunflower protein, um, chickpea protein, whatever you can think of. Um, is mixed with water in the process, um, therefore hydrated. And through the um, rotating action of the screws in the extruder, the material is um, netted and uh, plasticized, and you can get a denaturation of the proteins present in the, in the matrix. And this material is then pushed through a cooling die, which is attached to the end of the extruder. I can show you later how, the, how it looks like with this cooling die. But in the cooling die, the material is cooled. And through the laminar flow in the cooling die, you get the texturization of the product, and those fibers are formed in the in the product. So you get these dense layered fibers I already mentioned, which give this meat-like mouthfeel. And um, quality parameters, which can be defined, are for example the fiber length and or strength, or the texture and firmness of extruded. If you want to mimic different kind of meats, let's say you want to mimic a chicken meat, or you want to uh, mimic a, a beef or a lamb meat. Of course, you want to have different fiber strength and, and, and textureness and, and the different firmnesses in the product. And those are parameters you can um, influence by changing the process parameters in the extruder. The TVP product is basically manufactured uh, in a very similar way. So again, you mix a protein powder with water in the extruder. You get a kneading and plasticizing of the of the matrix, and you get denaturation of the proteins which are present in the matrix. But different to the HMMA product, the material um, is not cooled, but is directly exiting the extruder through a um, through a normal die, um, and then formed and cut. And because we have higher temperatures in the in the process. Um, you get these expanded structures. So sometimes you get these spongy structures, um, but you get these expanded products which lose the water through, flat, through flash evaporation. And you can, again, achieve different TVP textures, these different TVP structures, depending on, for example, cutting speed, die geometry, um, or further processing as milling or grinding. Um, these materials are then 
usually or most commonly dried and then packaged further. And now, how can we as Coperion um, help you as a solution provider? So we can offer you the technology to convert um, raw materials into meat substitutes. And this means we have a extruder solution and also entire process solution, which gives you the opportunity to change between the production of TVP and HMA um, very, very quickly and very um, in a very flexible way. So on the left side, you can see this is the extruder setup with the loss in weight feeder and the liquid feeder, which are both offered, of course, also from Coperion, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the protein and the water is processed in the extruder, and then with our hybrid solution, um, you can just interchange between, first of all, the TVP product. So you just attach a short dye to the extruder. You attach the centric palletizer, which is the number four, and you dry the product, which gives you the TVP product. Or you can just exchange the small dye with the cooling dye, which is shown in number five, um, which gives you the, um, the HMMA product. And you can then cut it further, process it further, marinate it, or freeze it, however you like, and you get your typical HMMA product. Now, in a, in a machine, it looks like this. So on the top, you have the machine setup or typical production machine setup for a TVP machine. So on the left side, you have the, the drive, the uh, coupling, um, the gearbox, the process section and the centric palletizer. And now you can, if you want to switch over to the HMA, you can just move the, the palletizer to the side. You can see that at the end of the extruder on the bottom picture that it's just moved behind and moved away. And then you can attach the cooling die to the extruder and you get the HMA product. Overall, with um, our technology, we have these um, uh, co-rotating twin screw extruders here. That's what the ZSK uh, stands for. So it's Zweischnecken um, Kneter. We have a modular screw configuration. So this means single elements, as you can see in the picture, are threaded to the shaft, you get a very big flexibility or large flexibility on define your screw configuration, which now heavily um, influences your product structure. And we have the um, possibility to set up the barrels. And um, we have a modular barrel um, uh, setup. So this means single barrels are coupled by flanges or held together by tie rods. And each barrel is heated and, co heated and cooled individually. So you can set up temperature profiles and set the temperature profile to the needs of your material and to the needs of your product properties. So this means um, we offer each customer an ind individual design. So we, we take our knowledge, we take our technology, um, we look for what is the product you want to achieve, the, the material you want to use for it, and then we can set up the extruder exactly fitting to, to your needs. Besides that, um, we have a high um, ratio of the inner and the outer diameter in the extruder. So this is ideal for food powders. Um, as some of you may know that the protein powders have a very low bite density and very poor flowability. And with our high free volume, we can achieve um, high throughputs and together with the high screw speeds, we can get texturization of proteins with different various uh, of various functionalities and various sources in the process. Our machines um, have a big range. You can they are modified so easy scale up is possible. So we start with the smallest machine with the set K twenty seven and go up to the set 125, which is a big production machine. Um, as I said, scale up is simplified and we can have direct transfer from lab uh, pilot scale to the production scale of our machines. This is what such products can look like. Um, that's a soy-based TVP um, on the left side as a dry chunk. And on the right side, after rehydrating with water, um, you can get these, if you then tear it up, you can get these nice fibrous meat-like uh, meat -like textures, meat-like structures. 
or for example, as I mentioned, you can process many different protein raw materials. Um, you can get a TVP out of um, out of P, which looks like the product on the left in a dried state, and after soaking in water, looks like the product on the right. And from this TVP products, after rehydrating, you can get or you can design products as as they are available. So, for example, we have these uh, hamburger patties on the left side, or you can just um, fry them directly, and you get such as such uh, textures or structures as in minced meat. For the HMA product, you get these continue, continuous, endless strand, strands out of the extruder, um, which show or exhibit these nice meat-like textures and fibers. Um, and after shredding and marinating, you get some appealing um, appearance. And you can, for example, produce such chicken chunks analogs or such chicken nugget analogs. And as I said earlier, um, we define ourselves over our partnership with our customers. So this means for our meat substitute applications, what we can offer, of course, is not only the hardware, so not only our extruders, uh, our feeders, and our expertise in material handling, but also our knowledge in, uh, in processing in general. So we have a large food extrusion processing team, as I mentioned, we are five dedicated food process engineers working with food extrusion um, with a lot of accumulated experience. And we have food test labs in Stuttgart, Germany, or in the US. I can go into detail later. Um, we offer industry recipes. So if there's a customer who doesn't know what he uh, wants to achieve or how to get to the product, we can, we can work on the recipe together and we can assist in the raw material selection. We also offer support in processing questions and we offer training and uh, process support on site. So even after delivery of the machine, um, we are there for training and uh, any type of support regarding um, operation, operation of the machine. And besides that, we have our big protein network. So this means we are in contact with institutes which can provide R&D. Um, we have, are in contact or in close contact with co-manufacturers we have also close contact to raw material providers and uh, different consultants. And um, we can we work together with different providers of downstream equipment for further processing and are up to date for with base research by academia. And all of them, of course, are continuously improving and um, developing in all three columns. And here, as I mentioned, we have these test facilities. So if there is any idea uh, any anything we want to test. Um, we have these extruders available in Stuttgart on these two pictures, which you can see on the left. So we have a small um, lab scale machine and a um, production machine here in Stuttgart available, but also even bigger machine sizes. <clears throat> and we have a lab in, uh, in the US with similar um, machines where you can also run trials and test your products. And now before I um, end my presentation, I want to kindly invite you to our food extrusion seminar, which will take place at the end of the year. Um, it's a quick, uh, not a quick, it's like a um, distinguished large uh, overview on all different topics in food extrusion. So if you want to get into the topic, this is a very good um, start. So it's very industry focused um, with different uh, talks about process opportunities, feeding raw materials or recipe ingredients. You can find more information on our website and you can also find us as company online on YouTube, LinkedIn or Twitter. And if there's any questions, please feel free to contact me um, anytime with these contact data. So thanks for your attention. So thank you for your interesting talk. <laughs> um, we have, I can see um, three questions here. So the first one is, um, which different wear mechanisms did you experience with extrusion of TVP and HMMA compared to regular used material? Um, 
I have to check the questions. I don't understand it on first sight. Um, yes, you can see it uh, at the bottom at F and A. Yes. Um, so with TVP um, and HMA, there's actually no real difference to other regularly loose materials, if that's a question. So those standard, I, I say standard protein raw materials you uh, encounter in, in meat substitutes, they are not different, for example, in, in the behavior in the machine to standard uh, starch-based raw materials. Um, so there are not more wear, there's not more wear or less wear than in any other applications. Probably I would say there is less wear. Um, for example, for the HMA, you have high water contents, you have low viscosity, so wear is reduced in comparison to other applications. And of course, there are some applications, let's say with some, some fibers which are exuded um, where you have more wear than in the TVP and HMA applications. I hope that answers the question. If not, please feel free to contact me anytime. Good. Then another question. Is Coperion using a preconditioner? Why or why not? Uh, no, we are not using preconditioners. That's a good question. Um, preconditioner is used to premix the materials and to get some energy into the material um, before the actual extruder process. Um, in our machines, it's not necessary. Um, we have high screw speeds and high free volumes, so we can realize energy input in the extruder as well, so we don't need any other machines. And by skipping other machines, of course, you reduce complexity of the process, you reduce uh, cleaning efforts, and you reduce anything else that comes with extra machines or extra machine parts. Okay, then the next question is, is single screw extrusion also an option or are twin screw extruders the only opportunity? Uh, as a Copernic employee, of course, twin screw extruders are the only opportunity, I must say. Um, no, but um, honestly, uh, single screw extruders have less um, ability to uh, introduce uh, energy into the material. You have um, worse mixing. Um, and overall, these are parameters you need for, um, for HMA and TVP products. Single screws can be used. Um, a wild guess can be used for very, very functional materials, um, which only need some water and, and heat to, to build a protein network. Um, but let's say that the development currently in the market is to not use these highly functional raw materials which are heavily pre-processed, but instead use like more natural products. So directly from the field, just mill it, grind it and dry it and defat it and then put it in the extruder. And these materials cannot be processed with single screws at all. Okay, so there are a lot of questions here. I hope <laughs> maybe we can't answer them all. Um, there's one. Um, can you please show the email contact once again? So maybe we do this at the end. Um, maybe Patrick, you can show your, your email address once again um, yes. at the end of the session. The next one, which requirements do you have for the feed material? For example, regarding flowability. Um, so this is something, of course, we have to, to test. Um, we are able to, we have many different technologies to get also very poor flowable materials into the extruder. Um, of course, depending on which materials you use, you have to adapt your feeding system. So uh, for a, a dry, nicely flowing powder, you need different feeders than for, let's say, a sticky, still a bit wet, uh, a, a, a side product from any fruit juice processing. And um, so there's no real requirement for the flowability. It's more like you have to adapt the feeding system, but that's, should, that's possible for all different flowabilities. Okay, thank you. So then we have another question uh, talking about maximum cap capacity on the TVP and HMA extrusion what will be in the future um so that sounds like a very general question but um so for the hma product we are current for the hma products we are currently 
um, offering solutions up to 500kg per hour with our machines. Um, for the TVP products, we are we are depending on the raw material. So if, if there's actually interesting for you, please contact us and we can go into more detail, but I would say about four tons per hour. Okay, so we have two last questions. <laughs> what is the achievable throughput? Yeah, that's I think that's a, that's the same question. It's just, same? Yeah, as the okay. question before, I hope so. Okay, if not, please uh, write again. Yes. <laughs> so then the next and last one, um, how is sticking of the proteins on the screws covered? Mm, so our, that's um, and the, 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 the co-rotating twin screw is, is intermeshing and is self-cleaning. So this means while the, the screws are rotating, it scrapes off the protein, which is sticking to the screw and just, conveying it towards the end of the extruder. Um, so there is no problem in the process of pro the protein sticking because it's always like a forward conveying mechanism active in the in the process. And um, yeah, I hope this answers the question and it's not about the, the about the feeders. In the feeders, it's, it's the same for, for uh, powder, for, for protein powders. With uh, Catron technology, we also offer intermeshing uh, uh, twin screw um, feeders, which are also self-cleaning, so you don't have any uh, sticking effect or very low sticking effect. Okay, thank you very much. So um, for the end, I would like to please you to just um, show again your contact uh, details, oh, yes, Patrick, no. because there was a question about it. So, and uh, yeah, during this time, I would like to say thank you, uh, Patrick, for your interesting talk, for answering all the questions. <laughs> and also a big uh, thank you for you, uh, dear participants, for joining us today at the virtual talk uh, about the topic, new food. There will be a lot of um, more talks come soon. So um, just take a look at our uh, website or follow us on the digital and the social media platform LinkedIn and stay tuned. And yes, we are very much uh, looking forward to welcoming you at Powtech in September from 26 to 28 together with Partech. And now have a nice day, have a nice afternoon and stay healthy. See you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>